Uh, welcome to our Monday night shiur. Our shiur, just I want to make this right, is sponsored by Rafua Shlema, Zev Ben Reuven, Shulamit Bad Yafa, Menashe Bet Pincha, Sonia Marusa Bat Yochevet, and for the Atzlachat Rachel Bat Sara. Hashem should bless them with bracha, Yeshua, Rafua Shlema, Atzlachat Bechol Medem Meta, Yeshua Od Gedolot, the Cheni Atzum Noar. I chose a topic today to speak about the Rabbi Akiva. The reason why I chose to speak about him today, to speak about him today, as we know, this is the last week of Shavavim, and uh, it's a known thing. Everything goes after the end, as the Gemara says. A person could be a Rasha his whole life, but if he does Teshuva at the end, they pick him up from Gehenom. I mean, it just takes one thought of Teshuvah, one thought of Teshuvah, it's enough to get him out of Geinom. And Rav Dov Kuk of Tveria says this is the meaning, as the Gemara in Sota says, that at the end of days, Hashem is going to give the Jewish people a king. There will be a king in the world that's as bad as Haman. Baal Korchan. And he's going to bring the Jews back against their will. But we know that's impossible. Why is that impossible? Because we had a king that brought us back to Hashem against our will and it didn't work out. And he was a Jewish king. His name was Yeh- uh, Hizkiyahu HaMelech. The Gemara says in Sanhedrin, he took a sword in front of the Beit Midrash and he says, whoever leaves the Beit Midrash, the Shul, Yidaker Bacherem, stab him. And they says there wasn't a child, a child from Dan until Be'er Sheva. That means from two ends of Eretz Israel that didn't know Hilchot Nida. Hilchot Tumah V'Tahara. That's the hardest Halachot. That means everyone knew Hilchot Tumah V'Tahara. It's unbelievable. I, I mean, you know what it means to learn Hilchot Tumah V'Tahara? Try one time, open up Hilchot uh, Rambam. The Rambam and Hilchot Tahara. Rabbi Avraham. Try once opening up the Rambam and Hilchot Tahara. Just the first chapter, Tumat Mit. The Akhot of Tumat Mit. What is going to go on over there in your mind? It's gonna, you're going to start having your brain. is going to start blowing up over there. Words you've never seen. Uh, terms you've never understood. So imagine what was the time of Chizkiyahu Amelach. And still, he messed up. Why did he mess up? He didn't say a song. After the miracle happened to him with Sanhariv, he did not sing a song. Okay, he didn't sing a song. So what? It's so important to Hashem. Ah, hallelujah. It's so important to God to sing a song. Yeah. Right. Apparently it is. No, Abraham? Yeah, it's, uh, apparently it's really important. So uh, so we see from here to, to bring us back to HaKadosh Baruch Hu through force is not a good idea. The Hashem doesn't want it. So why does the Mishnah say, why does the Gemara say, in Masachat Sota, at the end of days, God will give us a king as bad as Haman and he's going to bring us back to Hashem against our will. So Rav Dov Kuk explains, he's not going to make us all super religious. What's going to happen? At least one moment, all the Jews in the world are going to think, we want Hashem. They're going to have one hearer of Teshuvah. One thought of Teshuvah, that's enough to bring Mashiach Tzitzkeim. That one thought of Teshuvah is so important to HaKadosh Baruch to bring us all back. Down the line is all. Down the line, everyone, yeah. All. All what? But at one moment, everybody. Everyone, yes, exactly what I'm saying. But it's only one thought. I mean, it's just one Shema Yisrael Hashem okay? No, Hashem Echad, that's all you need. Just to admit Hashem is one. So in this last week of Shavarim, where everything goes after the end, and uh, this was a tough Shavarim. A lot of ups and downs, a lot of tests, because it's the year 5780, Tav Shin Pei. At the same time, it's supposed to be a year of wonders. Why? Tehesh not plaot tov shin pei. It's supposed to be a year. It's supposed to be a year of wonders. But before you're gonna get to the wonders, you have to go down. Before you go up, you gotta be down. No scary thing in life. You're always up or you're always down. Life is a galgal. Galgal is what? It's a circle. It's a wheel. It's a circle. You keep on going up and down, up and down. So why am I choosing to speak about Rabbi Akiva, Rabbi Avraham? Why am I choosing to speak about Rabbi Akiva? Because Rabbi Akiva is the semblance. He, 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 he symbolizes that a person could do whatever 
he could come back. He could do anything. He could he could be back to Hakadosh Baruch Hu, even at the age of forty years old, when almost half of your life is done. That means even if you're forty years old, Rabbi Tai, forty. What's forty years old? It's almost past midlife crisis. You're 40 years old. What's already your left? See your grandkids. Imagine, Rabbi Avraham, taking your kid to learn Aleph Bet. And you're going to go to kindergarten with your children, Avraham. And you're standing with your children inside the Ketana, inside the kindergarten. And you're sitting on the chair and on a, on a stool and you're learning with your son. Aleph Bet Vet, Aleph Kamat Spatach, Ah. Imagine, and then to, from that to turn into a man where Rabbi Dosa ben Harkinas and Masechet Kituvot Samech Gimel, I think, says over there, you are Rabbi Akiva, whose name goes from one end of the world to the other end of the world, with twenty-four thousand students, twelve thousand chavrutas, and from those twelve thousand students to have five students that all the Gemara is based on them. Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai is Rabbi Akiva's student. Rabbi Meir Baal Hanes, Rabbi El Azar Ben Shamor, Rabbi Yosef Ben Halafta, Rabbi Yuda Bar Ilai. You know what they used to say? But just, just look what they say about the student. You go over to say about the Rabbi. What did they say about Rabbi Yuda Bar Ilai? I was in Rabbi Yuda Bar Ilai's grave. I prayed over there. Over there, they buried inside Rabbi Yuda Ilai's grave the soap that they made out of the bodies of Jews in the Holocaust. The Nazis used to take the bodies of Jewish people and turn them into soap. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. And they buried that where? In the grave of Yudah Bar Eli. I prayed over there. Why did they choose? Yes. Why did they choose Yudah Bar Eli? Could you imagine who Yudah Bar Eli was? Who kind of tzaddik he was? Stam Rabbi Yudah in the Talmud is Yudah Bar Eli, the student Rabbi Akiva. You know what they say about him? Yudah Bar Eli, Rabbi uh, Avraham. You know what they say about him in the Gemara? They say about the Rebuda Bar Eli, Chacham, Bizman Shurotze. When he wants, he's a Chacham. When he wants, he's smart. So you look at the Gemara, what does that mean? When he wants, he's a good guy. When he doesn't want, he's a bad guy, Chas What does that mean, Chacham, Bizman Shurotze? He knows what to speak. No, you know what that means? Person gets you angry. And you just want to blow up. Your wife burnt the stew. She burnt the arsalo. She burnt the chillin. Again. <laughs> you don't want to. You want to blow. You want to blow them up. You want to blow them up. <laughs> or a person, you want you want to feel jealousy. Jealousy is a very. It's the first. It's the first feeling that any being in this world felt. By the way, what's the first feeling that a being in this world felt? Jealousy. Why? On the fourth day of creation. Not on the sixth day, on the fourth day of creation, the sun and the moon had a little uh, shalom bite issue. Right, you know what I'm saying? It was a bit of a shalom bite issue over there. What was it? Jealousy. It was a jealousy issue. And that's why in the sixth day of creation, the whole story of the Nachash was all jealousy. That's all it was jealousy. How did the Nachash trick Chava? How did she trick him? How did he trick her? Through jealousy. You, 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 you can't be like God. You don't have free choice. You did to Vara. She tricked him. He tricked her. Jealous. Rabbi Uda Bailai, whenever he wanted, he had total control of his feelings. He was a Chacham Bizman Shurotzer. He says, right now I'm a Chacham. Right now I'm in control. When he wanted to, he could show anger and not really feel angry. He had total control of his feelings. And the Gemara says, that was his Shevach. That was his greatness. Rav Mordechai Eliyahu, Zecher Tzadik, Kadosh Velivracha. Every Erev Rosh Chodesh, he used to try to pray by his kever, by Yudah Bar Eli's kever. That's what kind of Chacham he was. And you know what? Even in the Gemara, when Rabbi Yudah Bar Eli argues with Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai, who's the Halacha follow? Shimon. Believe it or not, Rabbi Yudah Bar Eli. Rabbi Yudah. Believe it or not, that's just a student of Rabbi Akiva. And that wasn't even his greatest student. Who was his greatest student? Rabbi Meir Ba'alanes. Yerushalmi. The Yerushalmi says that once Rabbi Akiva was putting his students together in a row, this is after 24,000 died. After they died, he was putting the five last ones, you know. Some say they were left over. Some say he was five new ones. 
He puts them together and he was putting them in order by greatness. Who does he put in the beginning? Not Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai. You think he put Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai? You know how many people visit the great Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai a year? Just on Lag Baomer, they estimate close to 350,000 people pass through, Lag, uh, through Meron. Do you know what that is? 350,000 people? <laughs> that's, some, that's as big as some countries. You know what I'm saying? It's, that's, 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 that's crazy. 350, I was there once in Lag Baomer. It's unbelievable. It's like Harabite. It's like going to Harabite on, on, uh, on, uh, on Pesach. In time of the Beit Amikdash. So many people and there's food and there's cakes and there's people giving music and people are dancing, people are having fun. People are, uh, what are they having fun for? Bar Yochai, Nimshach, They're having, they're, they're reveling in Rabbi Shion Bar Yochai. And he was not first in Rabbi Akiva's circle. Who was first? Rabbi Meir Valanes. You know why? Can I tell you guys a secret? Avraham, it's because of what you're doing right now. Semi. Because Rabbi Meir Bal Hanes, he wrote down the Mishnayot. You think Rabbi Uda and Asi, Rabbi, put the Mishnayot together? He used Rabbi Meir Bal Hanes's notes. It was his notes. That's why they say Stam Mishnah is who? Who's the Stam Mishnah? Shh. Who's Stam Mishnah? Rabbi Meir. Anonymous Mishnah is who? Rabbi Meir. Rabbi Yudan, as he just compiled it, he just put it. That's also, it's a, you know, it needs to be an edit, to edit a work like that. Could you imagine who's, you know what happened when he put the students together, Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai was second? You're going to say it's Ga'ava, Chas Shalom. No, it's not Ga'ava, it's for the Torah. Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai's face, he was put second, turned blue. Wow. He said, I'm second? He knew Ma'aseh Amir Kava. Look at the Zohar Kadosh. Everything is Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai. All the Etz Chaim, Otzrat Chaim, all the red, blue books of red. All Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai. Rabbi Akiva looks at Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai. Look at the beauty between this love between a student and a Rebbe. Rabbi Akiva looks at Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai and he says, Dayecha. It's enough that me and your creator know your worth. Wow. Wow, what a, what a verse. What, it's, it, I just got chills. I, I know the story and I just got chills. It's enough. Then me and your creator know your worth. Don't feel bad. It's the reason why I'm putting... You think Rabbi Shimon Baruchai got upset? His... Rabbi Shimon went first. Unbelievable, Rabbi This is Rabbi Akiva. You know who Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai was? You know who he was? 13 years in a cave of sand. I want to see you be one day in a elevator with no sand. Just in a small elevator. And imagine just being in a small elevator like that. Could you imagine being 13? I don't think you guys understand. 13 years in a cave of sand. Okay, Hashem, you know, he made a little miracle over there. And uh, suddenly uh, uh, some, some, some wine on Shabbat used to sprout forth. On Shabbat, be Abraham. He used to sprout forth on Shabbat. And suddenly, uh, what, what do you think Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai's food was for 13 years? You ever eat carobs? You're going to need a dentist after a week if you eat them every day. Huh. You're going to need a dentist. You know how hard carobs are? Your teeth are going to break. 13 years, he eats carobs. What is that? It's not even human. It's not even human. That's the student of Rabbi Akiva. Even more so the Rebbe. Even more so the Rebbe. Who was Rabbi Akiva Rabotai? A person at the age of 40 years old that didn't know Aleph Bet. That hated Talmidei Chachamim that he used to say, Give me a Talmid Chacham, I'm going to bite him like a donkey. Not like a dog, not like a fox, a donkey. <laughs> Once somebody asked me, How come the rabbi said to make tefillin out of a um, cow? How do you say cow in Bukharian? Karova. Karova, huh? Go. Go, go yeah? Go. He said, Do it out of, out of Pustichar, he said. Make it out of donkey. <laughs> it was a true, so he asked a, he asked a real question. This was his zakhut. I don't know. He asked the question. Okay? Rabbi Akiva said, I'm going to bite tongue with a like a donkey. Why a donkey? When a donkey bites, he doesn't let go. His jaw is going to come out with the bite. He's going to cut the head off. He's still going to bite. Until it breaks. That's how much he hated Tamid Chachamim. And from that to turn into Rabbi Akiva, that his name went from one end of the world to the other end of the world. 40 years old. We still got time. 
Yes yeah, or no? We still got time. So we still have time. So, okay, so, okay. <laughs> we still have time. And you know what? This past week was which parasha? Parasha oh, Yitzchro. Yeah. It says Moshe Rabbeinu went up to the heavens. The Jews said to Moshe, Bas. What's Bas? Must speak. We heard Hashem twice. We believe you. <laughs> Finished. Because they couldn't take it. They couldn't take it anymore. But some Jews can tell you a secret from the Zohar Kadosh. Don't share it with anyone. Just between me and you. The Zohar Kadosh says some Jews said we want to hear till the end. Hmm. You know who jo those Jews are? The Zohar says. Few, few. Those are the Jews that at the end of days hmm. they're going to want to stick to the Zohar Kadosh and the Etzah Hayim. Hmm. To the Otsrat Hayim. Those are the ones that missed the little parts of the Torah. Who, want the, who just want them... He want, they want the secrets of the Torah. Those are the Jews that said, no, we don't want Moshe to go up. We want to hear it ourselves. Wow. But the, most of the Jews said what? Majority. You speak. We're, we're good. They say that it was Yeah, they had, they had twice. They know, <laughs> one Tichat HaMetim was enough. No, twice. <laughs> they go out. He goes to the Shammai. Guess who he, what he sees over there. Look at the beauty of the Midrash. The beauty of the Midrash. The Midrash says he goes to the Shammai. Check this out. He sees a Kadosh Baruch Hu. Not that he sees, not that he sees something. He perceives a Kadosh Baruch Hu. And Hashem tells him what? Oh, Bukharians say this. When you see them and you don't tell them hello, what do they say? Ah, you don't, they didn't teach you in your house how to say hello? There's a saying like that. I forget the saying. I get it all the time because I can't see outside. I don't have my glasses on. So people are like, ah, you don't know that. Oh, so, 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 so Hashem tells Moshe, what? Didn't you have to say hello in your year? In your, in your city? Look how Moshe has, how Hashem has a relationship with Moses, with Moses, with Moshe Rabbeinu. Look at that relationship. Don't you want that kind of relationship? Don't you, Sela? Don't you want that kind of relationship? Don't you want that? Moshe speaks to Hashem like he's speaking to his Rebbe. Once I had a student. Listen to this. Today, like back in the day, it wasn't like back in the day. Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai went to yeshiva for twelve years. Twelve years after Sheva Barachot, he gets up, goes to yeshiva. Twelve years. That's Vidanya. I should hide me in ta. Rishiyon Bar Yochai is also strong. Imagine after one time and Laila Tov. That's it. Twelve years. Why don't I see you again? Rishiyon Bar Yochai. He had a relationship with Rabbi Akiva. Today, students don't have that relationship anymore. Why? Kesef is Ahav. Tuition, shmuition, this, that. Okay, this is the generation. What can you do? Once I had a student, I see him praying very strong in Shemona Yisrael. Look at the beauty of... Listen, there's Neshamot like this. He was praying in Shemona Yisrael. So I was curious. I said, uh, you know, like jokingly, I put my hands on his uh, shoulder. I said, what are you praying for over there? He says, I'm praying to Hashem. He says, I, tell, I said, Hashem, I don't have a teacher. I don't have a Rebbe. Could you be my Rebbe? Hmm. Wow. Wow. Isn't that fire? Isn't that crazy? I just got chills. Just remembering the story. Imagine that kind of a prayer. Because Hashem, I don't have a Rebbe. Could you be my Rebbe? Psh, wow, I'm tearing up over here. Could you imagine such a davening? This is not some davening from 50 years ago, 100 years ago. This is from our times. I'm telling you, it happened in the yeshiva that I teach. Could you imagine such a thing? A student could say such a thing? Moshe Rabbeinu goes up to Shammai and he has such a relationship with Hashem. Who doesn't want to be Moshe Rabbeinu? To the point where the Midrash says that even Mashiach Tzitkenu, Ben David, Sin David, even he's not going to reach the level of, of prophecy as Moshe. Even he's not going to... Why? He's, because the Torah says... There will never be a prophet like Moses. He's going to reach like him, but he will not overpass him. He will not pass him because Moshe Rabbeinu reached the level. Would you imagine Moshe Rabbeinu was how old when he left Egypt? Anybody tell me? Thank you, Rabbi Abraham. He was 40 years old. How old was Rabbi Akiva when he went to Yeshiva learning Aleph Bet? 40. 40 years old. Now I want to see if somebody here has a nitzot of Kedusha. <coughs> There is one other leader of the Jewish people at the age of 40 years old. Yeshua ben <laughs> At the age of 40, that he also started. And the Ariyah Kador says these three people, Moshe, 
Rabbi Akiva and this other rabbi, they're very closely related in their neshama. That's why they all started at the age of 40. Ari? Ari, no, he died at 38. <laughs> huh? He finished before time. Rabbi Haim he passed away much later, but no, he started earlier. Recent? No, no. The time, I think we were in time of the Mishnayot. Huh? Rabbi Maimon, no? Uh, Rambam? No, yeah. if he would have started at the age of 40, when I'm not, it's like, huh? Yeah. I'll give you a hint. We, I'll, no, we, I'll give you a hint. We, we pray it, we pray it. His name resembles a prayer we say on Rosh Chodesh. That's it, I'll give you the biggest hint. Hilena Zaken, thank you very much. You guys asked me so. That was you? That was him. He led us again. He led us again. The says also, first 40 years, he was Osegba Prakmatia. He used to work. 47th Street. 48, 40, the year 40, suddenly, Nichnasbo, Ruach Tarash, Mayava Aftalion. He suddenly became Gedon Israel. Something with the number 40. Something is going on. We've got to figure this out. Maybe we're going to figure it out today. Maybe we're not. Listen, I can't promise you everything over here. Let's see. Chill. 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 Okay, but not yet. Okay. You're the greatest, but not yet. <laughs> so Moshe goes up to Shamaim. He sees Hakadosh Baruch Hu writing a Torah. He perceives it in Nevuah. As if Kivyachol Hakadosh Baruch Hu is writing a Torah. Wait a second. I know you're the greatest, but <laughs> breathe. And he says to HaKadosh Baruch Hu, what's uh, my kulehai? What are you doing over here? Aren't you supposed to be done? And he sees Hashem putting what part of the Torah in? Which part? Which part? What is he putting again? The crowns. The tagim. Thank you very much. He puts the crowns. He's putting the crowns in. You know the crowns? You know the crowns? Yeah? Tagim, they call. So Hashem, Moshe tells to Hashem, who's stopping you from finishing the job? That means, how come we gotta put the crowns in? Who needs the crowns? You got the letters. Crowns, okay, they're beautiful. Shkoya. Do the crowns make a Torah pasul chasu shalom? No. Mezuzah? No. Tefillin? No. What are you the crowns for? So Hashem, look at this beauty. Hashem tells Moshe Rabbeinu, one day there's gonna be a guy. He's gonna be Sfaradi. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> He's gonna be a guy. He's going to be Doresh. And these tagim, these crowns, He's going to teach from these crowns laws. From crown. Moshe said, I can't believe it. Impossible. Show me. Show me. Thank you. Show me. Fast forward. God says, look. He doesn't say look forward. What does he say? Look back. Sometimes you got to look back to look forward. Moshe looks back and he sees himself, the Midrash says, in Rabbi Akiva's classroom. Which row? Eighth. Ah, he sees him in the eighth row. That means Moshe Rabbein was not even in the first row. Wow. Rabbi Akiva's class. Wow. Now, I'm not, I'm nobody. I'm just saying what the Midrash says. Wow. I don't know what the row he was in. It doesn't say. I'm assuming he sees himself in the eighth row of the 24,000. This is even before Bishimon. It's even before. That's what I'm assuming. That's what makes sense. Because why would you need eight rows for five students? Right? So he sees himself in the eighth row and he sees Rabbi Akiva going back and forth with his students. Amazing. Rabbi, Moshe Rabbeinu perceives this in what? Prophecy on Mount Sinai. And Moshe Rabbeinu, the Midrash says, felt bad. Because he didn't understand what was happening in the classroom. He was LD, they call it today. Learning disabled. That's the term these days. LD. Yeah. And he felt bad. And the Mafarshim asked, why was Moshe Rabbeinu feeling bad? He's Moshe. He didn't understand? Because Moshe Rabbeinu understood the Torah through the Pnimiut, through prophecy. That means for Moshe, there was no question. 
Rabbi Akiva was able to find a halacha without prophecy, through crowns and extra letters and words. Moshe Rabbeinu didn't understand. How would you even understand the halacha like that? Because for Moshe, everything was what? Prophecy. prophecy. It was a much higher level. That means if you're on a very high level, you could sometimes not see the person on the lower level. But at the same time, that means the person on the lower level is higher. That's what it means. Sometimes the opposites attract. Moshe Rabbeinu felt very bad. You with me? It's a story. You feel bad with him. That means I'm saying good story. He says, Moshe Rabbeinu felt so bad until one person asked the halakha from Rabbi Akiva. And Rabbi Akiva had no choice to say, Halakha le Moshe Misinai. Let's see if anybody here has that spark. Can anybody here tell me one halakha? Let's say tefillin. It's not going to be an easy one. That's halakha le Moshe Misinai. The black straps. The black straps. Ah, now you're talking. Black straps. Who says feeling has to be black straps? And anyone else? Another one? Two witnesses. Two witnesses. Also, how much is nice? Another one? The what? The what? The boxes? I'm thinking of something else. The what? Ben Enecha is another one, but I'm thinking of something else. Something that's it's staring at you right in the face. What's the first letter of Shema? Shin. The shins. Shins on the, the filling. <coughs> One is four. Where do we see a shin that's four letters? That's four heads. Only in Tefillin. Four and three. Halakha Hamshim is Sinai. Also, where do we see another thing? A lot of Halakha Hamshim in Masechet Sukkah. Masechet Sukkah, Lavud, Shloshad Fanot, everything Halakha Hamshim is Sinai. There's no explanation to it. Only Halakha Hamshim. When Moshe Rabbeinu heard that, what did he do? He calmed down. No, Sha'anis is a hook. It's from the Torah. It's from the Torah. It's a hook. It's a hook. So we know it. We know what Sha'anis is. So what do we see from here? Moshe Rabbeinu heard. Halachala Moshe Misi. He felt a little bit. Moshe Rabbeinu goes back to HaKadosh Baruch Hu. He leaves the prophecy within the prophecy. This is crazy. This is a story within a story within a story. He goes to HaKadosh Baruch Hu and he says... You have a person like this that can get Torah through Pilipul. And he's going to be the greatest sage to the point where Rabbi Akiva was the student of who? Of who? Rabbi Eliezer and Rabbi Yehoshua. And, and Rabbi Yehoshua was a levy. He said, In my life, nobody ever beat me in an argument. That's who's Rabbi Yehoshua. Rabbi Yehoshua ben Hananiah. And Rabbi Yeshua was, was the Rebbe of Rabbi Akiva to the point where we say, Rabbi Yeshua argues to Rabbi Akiva, who's the halacha like? Rabbi Akiva. Wow. That means he surpassed his teachers. So Moshe Rabbeinu went to Hashem and he said, Give him the Torah. Why are you giving it to me? Look at the humbleness of Moshe Rabbeinu. Humbleness of humbleness. That means he's about to give the greatest gift to Am Yisrael. And he tells Hashem, pass. <coughs> what does this remind me of? What does this remind me of? At the burning bush. That means Moshe Rabbeinu never stopped arguing with God. He was always finding new excuses to say, I'm not worthy to give the Torah. This is a man who was the greatest prophet in the history of the Jewish people and will always be the greatest. Even Mashiach, even greater than Mashiach. And still, he didn't stop from writing in the Torah that he was the most humble man. Why? God told him to write it. Because when your Rebbe tells you to write something, you write it. And Moshe Rabbeinu asked HaKadosh Baruch Hu, You showed me the greatness of Rabbi Akiva. Show me what is his reward. His reward, he says. The name of this, the wording in the Midrash. What did Hashem say? Look back again. <laughs> Sometimes you got to look back to look. And he sees butchers selling the flesh of Rabbi Akiva in a butcher shop. The Midrash says that on Yom Kippurim, Tornos Rofos Harasha took Rabbi Akiva and flayed his skin 
alive while he was saying Kriyat Shema of Shaharit. Netzahama. Right at uh, dawn. Imagine, and the Gemara says, why did Rabbi Akiva have such a horrible death? From all the ten martyrs, he had the most <laughs> horrible death. Chas v'shalom. Why? Rabbi Ishmael, Kohen Gadol, his skin was flayed from him. He got to his tefillin, his neshama came out. Rabban Shimon Megamliel, head was chopped off. Uh, Rabbi Hanna ben Tradion was burnt with the Torah. But Rabbi Akiva, while he was alive, they took an iron comb and ripped his flesh. And then they sold it in the market as a sigula. I'm not joking with you. That's what the Romans did. That's the, our, our buddies. The, yeah. They sold his flesh by the pound. In, in, uh, in the butcher shops. In Caesarea. Where? In Israel. In Caesarea. Could you imagine such a thing? So Hashem, so the Gemara says, why was Moshe Rabbeinu, why, why was Rabbi Akiva have such a punishment? You know why? I'm going to tell you the answer. You guys are going to, you're going to say, uh, hands up. You guys are going to say, hands up. You're not going to want to know the answer. It's a scary answer. I'm going to tell it to you anyways, because it's the last week of Shavavim and we need a little more inspiration. Because we're going into Adar, we're going into Purim, and we're still not, we're still not, we need more, we need more, we need more Shefa. The Gemara says a scary story. In Masech of Al-Mitziah, it says that one of Rabbi Akiva's rabbis was one of the greatest. His name was Rabbi Eliezer Hagadol. He was big. <coughs> he was so big, his nickname was Hagadol. Some are called Sadiq, some are called Hasi. He's called Hagadol. He's big. The the Perkei Avot said if you put Rabbi Eliezer Hagadol on a scale. scale and all the other rabbis and the other scale, he's gonna. In which generation that every rough, every Tana could bring to Ketam wow. the And Rabbi Eliezer Hagadol once said the halacha. That it's called a tanur shel achnai. It's a certain oven that you could put it apart. It's made brick by brick, brick by brick. It's a portable oven that it's not a kavua. And Rabbi Eliezer said they found a snake coiled around it. And Rabbi Eliezer said all the truma, all the kohen kohen foods that were made in there tahor. It's pure because it could be broken apart. And Rabbi Yehoshua, his best friend. And all the rabbis, when it comes to the Torah, there's no best friends. You know what I'm saying? Rabbi Yehoshua comes with Rabban Gamliel, his, his brother-in-law was the Nasi. Rabbi Eliezer's wife was called Ima Shalom. She was Bukharian. I'm telling you, we have big Shorashim. Her name was Ima Shalom. She, Rabbi Eliezer's wife. Her name was Ima Shalom. She, she was the sister of Rabban Gamliel Hanasi. Rabbi Gamliel Diavne. I was looking to pray by his kid. No, that was the, but that was his grandfather. Uh, and then that's Rabban Shimon ben Gamliel Harishon. And then so Rabban Gamliel, his his brother-in-law, Rabbi Yehoshua, his best friend, that learned under Rabbi Yochanan Ben Zakai with him, and all the other rabbis of Yavne get together and they put Rabbi Eliezer Hagadol in excommunication. Wow! wow. Because it was a time of shmad. It was a time where the Jews were in a very bad state. And if one rabbi is going to go against all the rabbis, the whole Torah could topple. They're going to say, if one rabbi is too smart, we're going to go with him, not with the rest. But the halacha is, you got to go with the more, with the majority. Yeah. Even though Rabbi Yezak like, was right, they put him in excommunication for the sake of Torah to be saved. They put him in excommunication and nobody could learn Torah from him. Nobody could do business with him. He had tears coming down his face. Tears. Uh, Abraham. Tears. A third of the world's olives, wheat, and barley, if I remember correctly, were burnt then that day. Just from his tears. That's Hashem was 
And Hashem agreed with him. That's what the Gemara says. Matzi, above Matzi, they, Hashem agreed with him. Dafnun, I bet I don't remember. Hashem agreed with him. Could you imagine such a thing? Who was Rabbi Eliezer Agadol? And he was one of the rabbis of who? Rabbi Akiva. And because they put him in excommunication, Rabbi Akiva couldn't learn Torah from him. Look what happens when a student can't learn Torah from his rabbi. When he wants to get discommunicated from his rabbi. Rabbi Eliezer Agadol is passing away. Years upon years, he can't transmit his Torah. And the Torah says, the Gemara says, he only got, he only got the Torah from his Rebbe, Rabbi Yochanan ben Zakai, Tzadik Yesod Olam, who saved the whole Torah, as the Gemara says, Gitin says. He, he said, I only got from him like a dog that licks water from an ocean. Could, you, could a dog lick water from an ocean? Would, a, would the ocean ever go down? Mapiton. Rabbi Eliezer said if all the skies were klaf, was a, was a clear, klaf, clear. Yeah, yeah, yeah. parchment, parchment. 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 parchment, and all the and all the waters were ink, and all the trees were were feathers. It couldn't. It wasn't. It's not gonna be enough to write the Torah that I learned, which was like a dog licking from the ocean from my rabbis. And he knew three hundred halachot and masechet yibamot that he never taught anyone. And 300 halachot and sorcery, they never taught anyone. Students came to say last time goodbye. Shkoyach. You didn't see your Rebbe for so many years. You didn't respect your Rebbe. Shh. You didn't respect your Rebbe. You didn't see your Rebbe. You came to him after so many years to visit him on his deathbed. It was Yom Shishi. What's Yom Shishi? Friday, air of Shabbat. He was wearing his tefillin on his deathbed. And he looked at all of his students and he said, you guys are going to die a horrible death. You guys are going to die a horrible death. Huh? Because they didn't learn Torah from him. And he had so much Torah to transmit. And they didn't take it from him. And he looked at Rabbi Akiva. And he started to shake, him and Rabbi Akiva, both of them, they started to shake like they were in some kind of unison trance, like some kind of weird trance, and they started to shake. And he said, your death is going to be the worst. Because your heart was as open as an ulam. Ulam is a hall, elite palace. It was as big as a hall, and you could have taken my Torah. That's why your death is going to be the worst. But he couldn't, exactly, he couldn't. He was an excommunication. What is he going to do? Why is he going to punish for that? Doesn't matter. It's your Rebbe. You got to do what you got to do. You got to do what you got to do. You got to go learn Torah from him. You got to get the Torah from him. He had so much halakha to transmit. And I'm going to tell you guys a secret of secrets that was revealed with the Mekubalim of the later generations. The Ariya Kadosh was the Gilgul of Rabbi Eliezer Agadol. And Rabbi Chaim Vital was the Gilgul of Rabbi Akiva. <laughs> and Rabbi Chaim Vital had to come back. Sorry, Ariya Kadosh told him in Sefra Hezionot, I'm coming here to teach Torah to you and only you. But Rabbi Chaim Vital didn't. He didn't get the hint, and he brought in more students and more. Ari says, you're killing me over here. <laughs> Again. I'm here to teach Ari. you. And all the Kabbalah that we have, the Ari, Shara, Pesukim, Etz Hayim, only comes from a year and seven, eight months of teaching Rabbi Haim Vital. Imagine the mind of Rabbi Haim Vital. Rabbi Akiva. Nitzot Rabbi Akiva. And that's why Rabbi Chaim Vital said, every time I see a, a, a bunch of people, my neshama wants to come out, I want to die. Because hmm. he remembered, Rabbi, uh, Dari told him, you remember how in last, your past lifetime, how you died like Rabbi Akiva. And that's why the Rabbi Akiva married two wives, Rabbi Chaim Vital married two wives. So many connections, so many connections. Could you imagine, because you didn't learn the, enough Torah from your Rebbe. He didn't show his Rebbe what he was supposed to give him. What happens at the end of the day? Yeah. They have to come back in a Gilgul to do it. Wow. wow.
If your mind is not blowing up in a million particles, I don't know what's going to make it blow up in a million particles. Oh, the more so for us. And we're back here for what? We're here to finish our Torah. I'm going to tell you a famous story of Moshe Feinstein. There was a guy in time of Moshe Feinstein, MTJ. I heard this story from my Rebbeim. I don't know. That's why I heard it. That he was learning with his son, one guy who was in Amaretz. He was learning with his son, Gemara. His, he was, his son was teaching him a daf of Gemara. It took him six months, something like that, to learn one daf of Gemara. One daf! After that one daf, he made up a party. Hmm. After that party, he passed away. Wow. Oh, wow. And Moshe Feinstein said he came to this world to finish that one daf of Gemara. Wow. Rabotai, we don't know what we're here for. We gotta do everything, including Pijon Petar Hamor. We gotta do everything, Rabotai! <laughs> You guys are not helping me out over here. I'm doing this for your good. I will do it at the end. Don't worry about me. I want to join everyone in on this. But could you imagine the power of Rabbi Akiva? Now, there's one more story I want to say about Rabbi Akiva, but it's already time is up. Why am I saying this story at the end of Shobabim, guys? Remember this. Remember this. You could think you're the biggest Rasha. You could think you're the biggest uh, no good. If at the age of 40 years old, Rabbi Akiva, Moshe Rabbeinu, Hillel Azakin, could come back to Torah and Mitzvot and become the greatest leaders of the Jewish people to the point where their Nishamot are the greatest Nishamot, Rabbi you could do it too. By one condition, you have to be Anav like Rabbi Akiva. And what was Rabbi Akiva's last lesson he taught to the Jewish people? Oh. Anyone here know? Loving your fellow Jew is the greatest lesson in the whole Torah. Baruch Adonai Amen. Amen.